interesting that uh, you read, there's actually now about, there's over 500 cities in the world with over a million people in them. So I was thinking about one of them and go there on Expedia. It's called Gaziantep. It's got about 2 million people. Yeah, yeah. Famous for copperware products, delicious tamakoon, and the sweet pastry baklava. It also has archaeological sites. About 2 million people, like four Bostons. It is in Turkey. Anybody heard of this place? Yeah, I have. This is a sad story, actually. This city was heavily damaged in the in the earthquake, the recent Turkish earthquake. So probably can't get there on Expedia as fast as you used to be able to. But I guess my point was there's there were there was there probably still are close to two million people living in this city. It's a center of regional cuisine, archaeology, and I'd never even heard of it. I could spend two years traveling around to cities of over a million people and they look pretty cool. <laughs> Sounds fun to me. Anyway, just saying, don't be terrified. Be happy. Maybe that wasn't the best example. All right, cities and cultural ecology. I really like this chapter. Sadly, cities in the realm of cultural ecology have basically for a long time been ignored as we just read through five chapters talking about the Arctic and the high altitude and the humid zones and the grasslands and the deserts and all the places where there aren't that many people. And, um, you know, that's good. It's good that we did that. But I also feel like we could probably expand this chapter and have it be three or four chapters and maybe condense those other places. If those, if we don't want to be terrified and we want to deal with this uh, concentration of population. It has also been, I think, cities from the cultural ecology viewpoint on cities for a long time did them stupidly. This is my opinion. I just found some of that stuff that was like, oh yeah, it's uh, Darwinian in the city. You know, it's, no, it's not. Yeah, it was dense. Um, <laughs> it wasn't that great. I mean, in the same way that remember when we were reading that theories of cultural ecology chapter and some of them were just dumb, kind of the same way. All those ideas got brought back. Yeah, time. yeah, same kind of thing. So, you know, I think we're getting better. Anyway, the good news is, no. as I like to put it, <laughs> Yay. USA, USA, USA. We have number We have eight of the ten largest cities in the world by aerial extent. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> We're number one. Eight of the largest ten cities in the world by aerial extent, which means sprawl man means big cities that take a long time to even get from one end to the other even get there yeah louis i was actually reading this article you know those like play mats that children have that have like the little streets and you push a car on it and drive around yeah i read like someone who hypothesized that that is like training kids to be pro car centric architecture or infrastructure, car-centric infrastructure being pre-programmed into children with those big car mats. With the car mats. I grew up on some train, the train engine, and they had those little connectors. So I guess I'm probably yeah, like, sure. I was a Thomas guy, a big Thomas guy. I guess I was probably yeah. Into that, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> if we were if we were really programmed by those things, there'd be so much wildlife in the world. There'd be so many giraffes around and elephants. I mean, you know, 
if we had any programming by our fuzzy animals that we play with, we'd see panda bears everywhere, man. So I don't know, maybe. I don't think. I don't think that's. I don't think that's something I'm going to worry about if I give my kids a play mat with cars on it or not. We're worried about that. Part. Yeah, exactly. Worry about that. You can play mat it up. All right, so Tyler was going to talk about the sprawl, and then he was going to have a fight with Liam, who was going to talk to us about the European model instead. Instead, uh, this, this chapter was almost like a long chapter on how much better the Europeans are than we are. So, you know, we're just going to have to roll with it. It's, if Moran said it, it's always true. All right, Liam, how do they do it? <laughs> you're from Boston, man. You're always agreeing with the Europeans. That's what the Bostonians do. We know that. I mean, except the tea party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in Europe, they have uh, Holland. They said is uh, one of the largest population dense cities in Europe, and in the same part of Holland is around thirteen to twenty percent of the country. That just, it almost like made me mad. Yeah. It's like, it's like angering how much they maintain their city density and their population is going up, but they maintain, they keep them in the cities and they're still dense. And then this just, it just actually really bothered me how quickly they could get from there to the nature. Stockholm residents, that's Sweden, of course, can travel to the archipelago. That's like the islands, I guess, and other natural areas by public transportation in less than half an hour. I know. And in Vienna, Austria, it is but a short train ride from the center of the city to 7,400 hectares. A hectare is about 2.5 acres, by the way. That's those hectares that were dropping all those leaves of protected forests. The only thing they have relevant. Good job. <laughs> they do have a lot of that. And Victoria, why else would they say when we say, oh, let's just go back into the cities? Why can't we? Yeah, they just did. They just redensified all those cities. Didn't matter. And uh, there's one thing that they're not afraid of that we have to be afraid of. Guns. Oh, guns. <laughs> oh, guns. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> I mean, it's... It's easier. You like to make fashion show that I mean, and most and most of them do actually have pretty strict gun control measures. Um, yeah. And there are there are places there are places where people do have individual ownership of guns, but it's because they're all in the army and they have to have the, the guns locked away in the basement. Switzerland. Yeah. We're yeah. number one. I mean, it is really strange. I don't want to go on a rant here, but it's strange to watch people come to this country from other places and just be completely puzzled by it, you know, because these are things that we just take for granted, and they're like, what? They're so confused by this. They do not, they cannot understand it, and I actually find myself puzzled as well. I can't understand it. <laughs> it's puzzling. It's just, it's just can't, can't. I mean, puzzling is one word. I'm just going to use the word puzzling because I don't want to use this word. Yeah.
I do not know that. Oh, somebody okay. told me it was. I did hear that from somebody that we're it's we have much more fully stocked pharmacies, I guess. So there you go. Because uh yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm not sure about that. We do a lot of we do a lot of drugs here. That's right. All right, Jacob. So what do you need to get around to all this sprawl? I know. It went dark because I'm talking to Jacob. I can't give him the answer before he tells it to me. Need the cars. Yeah, we need all those cars. You need the roads. And who pays for the roads? Yeah. So, and it would be one thing if we just use all these little cars. Don't they look nice? Those little, little tiny cars running around. Yeah. Yeah. And little, little tiny cars there. But the problem is, as you may know. Today, it's not just that, that we all have cars, we all need big, loud trucks for SUVs. Again, I am puzzled by this. I grew up at a time when people were seeming to get more fuel efficient and smaller cars, and then all of a sudden everything changed again, and it's like, need my truck. Don't understand. Hmm. They are convenient. All right, in European cities, they do a lot more walking. They have to walk all the time. Good, yeah. <laughs> my sister just went on a, my sister went on a trip to Barcelona and she came back and she's like, it's like we walked to all these restaurants. You could walk everywhere. She keeps talking about it. It's like a, it's like a, she's like, I, I'm like, you told me that already. <laughs> but she keeps, she's so amazed by it. She keeps saying how much they, they're walking everywhere. Um, in this country, unfortunately, in many of our southwestern cities, climate change is making it so hot that even if we wanted to walk, it would be too hot to walk. So that's kind of sad. Um, and of course, you don't want to get shot. So, <laughs> gotta, <laughs> gotta watch out for walking all right Anaya so if they're not walking what else are they doing there in Europe public transport system as Moran said public transit is viewed as a public good an essential public service fundamental to public welfare. I think he decided that if he used the, used the word public one more time, it would win. It would triumph. He got it to four times in one sentence <laughs> to double check to make sure he really used the word public that much. It's a dangerous word. If you misspell it, you're in trouble. You can put Republic for the Republic. Yeah. So an essential, a public good. So the, I think the difference is, or one of the differences is that they think of this as something that should benefit all of society. It should be for everyone. And when they mean public welfare, it's not that they're about to make fun of somebody. It means the common good, the good of all. To the extent that this made me, me mad too. Why am I getting so mad in this chapter? I know. You guys were terrified. I'm getting angry. Well, it's first shock and then you. Right, right, yeah. Uh, Zurich. Zurich, they reduced the number of parking spaces in the city center, made them pay. Even the wealthiest, those guys are wealthy in Zurich. 
Even the wealthiest residents of Zurich use public transportation because it is so effective and pleasant. Effective and pleasant. Unlike here, Autumn, who uses public transportation here? Second class citizen? That's sad. Yeah, here we imagine that it's just those poor people or those old people or those poor old people who are all riding around. We don't want to be on public transport because it's all full of those people. Oh, man. Yeah. So just imagine the wealthiest people riding around in the same stuff, having a public good. No. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to go over this very quickly. I think I almost eliminated this. In the U.S., our cities, even in our cities, they have a high energy use per capita. Whereas, as I try to describe about New York City, I mean, it's essentially a place where you can save a lot of energy per person. And so... I mean, if you think about living in a rural or spread out place, uh, if you have to all heat your individual homes as opposed to larger structures, they can be highly efficient. They're not as efficient as they could be in the United States, but they could be. In general, in the United States, PowerPoint told me this is what I should show you guys, a hot dog. In general, we tend to prioritize getting our food from far away. And we transport it over long distances so that it can all be standardized and served to us very quickly. In the olden days, places like Oneonta, Walton, were catchment areas for the food sources for New York City. So we'd have cattle farming and dairy, which went to New York City. Now it all comes from... Probably Wisconsin, but it can be shipped or shipped far away. I mean, we're trying to get some of this back, you yeah. know? Whereas in other places, like in Europe, <laughs> they have the slow food movement. Like, you know, eat your food slowly, prepare your food, support your local farmers, prioritize your local food in your local catchment area. Uh, big. I did spend a couple days once in Paris and happened they happened to have the agricultural fair. It was like they it was like one of the most popular events where all the people came in and ate a whole bunch of cheese and everybody was happy with their baguettes. They walk around on the streets and buy them every day. Every day you buy a food. Not just once a week. <laughs> We are trying, darn it. Absolutely. We're trying. Poor farmers, they'll have to go around all these markets and talk to people. Yeah, I know. They have to market. Have you been over Texas? Have you seen how bad the road infrastructure is over, like down over in Texas and how they don't have like lane systems? And if they want to build like a new highway or if they want to build a new lane, they don't like 
they have to make a separate road. So then you get like these piles of like spaghetti roads where it's one road on top of another road and then it's another on top of it, it just it's just meant to because public tra like transportation down there is so not focused on that. It's you literally can drive down to like you can there's like whole areas of maps where it's just like roads on top of roads. Yeah, I mean we could probably we could probably have a whole class on transportation and car mats and those kind of things. Yeah, no, it's a huge, it's a huge issue. And the way federal funds have been used for those kind of things. No, he was fine. The interstate system is awesome. Copied it from the Germans. So, you know, that was fine. It's the latter stuff that got him into trouble. Anyway, let's move on to water. We'll come back to roads. Liz, you put a bunch of flood control, then what happens? All right. Yeah. So on the one hand, you have all this water usage and basically water waste for lawns, golf courses, swimming pools, the individual kind. And you also talked about the flooding part in Los Angeles. Remember that? <laughs> Maybe less fun. <laughs> I am just going to say to redesign the flooding system. So even though we don't have the big road, flood control, flood control, security, or PPC flooding. Yeah, this was really interesting to me. So in Los Angeles, they have all these dams and basins, paved river channels, but it still floods just as much, if not more. So they say that they need to move from fail-safe designs, because they're failing, to safe-to-fail designs, which is kind of fascinating to me, and using natural materials to absorb that water and you're right the wasted water the lawns the golf courses all those things whereas past the europeans what can they do Yeah, you can make permeable things, recycle the water that comes through. Maybe you bathe in the water, but then it gets used to water the plants. Yeah. That is actually true. It was once terrible. I mean, it was an example of how not to do things, but it's turned itself completely around. So, yeah, I was going to talk about that in a second. Zeke, what should we do here? Can we do anything about this? Oh, for everything. For everything. Should we just let the Europeans be? We just let them go, be them because they're them and be us because we're us. <laughs> we should green our cities.
Yeah, we can green our cities. As this book says, we can learn from European cities and we can take some of the lessons and apply them. Like this city. That is a nice city, isn't it? It's Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, man. This was in the United Nations blog, if you can believe that. Pittsburgh in the United Nations blog. It's not too far from here, and it was once seen as this industrial wasteland of a place, and it's Pittsburgh, which doesn't sound very nice. But there it is. It's been greening itself. In fact, it's been a global powerhouse for sustainable progress. I put up Pittsburgh because everybody in the United States wants to talk about Portland or San Francisco or Ithaca or Boston. You know, but those places are all places where the liberals are and the money people, and it's too expensive to be there. But here you go, Pittsburgh. And you're absolutely right, Louis. Las Vegas, an unlikely model for water conservation, declared war on thirsty grass. You can't have a lawn in Las Vegas anymore. Set an example. And it's doing all kinds of things. I don't think you can have a big pool anymore. So Las Vegas... <laughs> Is there's it's still an issue in the southwest if you haven't realized but they're they are trying there's another thing we might be able to do anna what else might we do ow oh but i still want to work oh yes there is some i was looking into this and this Book. I, I'm glad that Moran got this in there, a little bit of COVID-19 stuff about how people, and, and we got all excited for a couple months. We thought this was going to solve all our, all our problems if we started working on Zoom. I don't think it really, yeah. Um, some, though. I mean, it does have potential. There's a study that asked, does telecommuting save energy? What do you think? Yeah. The answer is, it is complicated because it's kind of like having a city. If everybody sets up their own en energy and their own stuff and their own driving, and then you're doing more driving because you're in a rural area and we don't have public transportation, it's hard to say. It could have some effect. There are some cities where, you know, with particularly long commutes, where it could be, it could be good. So another, uh, I, apparently Mexico City has become a popular place for telecommuters to go live, and pay Mexico City rents, work remotely. But some Mexico City residents are pissed off because they feel like these telecommuters are messing up their neighborhoods. Look at that city. Isn't that beautiful? It is an amazing place. It's crazy amazing. So it's good. No. So this leads us to a question which I think Moran poses in here. Some of you have, and that's why you were frightened, terrified, which is the idea that in especially in the non-European cities and outside of the United States, especially, but perhaps here too, that you'll get this combination of sprawl plus income inequality resulting in slums, but you'll have these high rise crazy apartments. And so you'll have gentrification. And obviously this is a serious issue and we have to, we have to consider it. Um, on the other hand, there are places that we can look to, not in Europe, for examples of urban sustainability, like this beautiful city. Zeke, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> but what prompted you to write it?
All that stuff. Look at that. I mean, some of the pictures from Singapore, I couldn't even believe they were real. I was looking at them, and I didn't, I'm not even showing them to you because they look like they were from some other planet. Yeah. Mickey, what would we be scared of if these plants are all growing up our walls? What we what are we used to be scared of? Yeah. Hmm. Really? That's hard for me to believe. I'm going to keep ripping it off my side of my house. But, oh, God, thanks. <laughs> I think you got to plan it. You plan it like this, it'll work. Like I said, there's some, there's other, look up the gardens by the bay of Singapore. They look like they're from, yeah, some other world. Yeah, what's one of the problems with this classroom? Nowhere to look. Nowhere to look. Just a big screen staring you down. I don't know. In Brazil, which is often taken to be a place of sprawl and slums and terribleness, there are some examples of this Curitaba. Curitiba, sorry, is one of is taken to be one of the top ten sustainable cities in the world and they've done a lot with all kinds of things but they're actually pretty famous for the world's first rapid bus transit system and they built all these cool know, what you'd call them these glass tunnels so people get up and then you walk straight into the bus so you don't have to climb any stairs you just zip in there zip out getting people around fast so even in places like Brazil, which has grown infamous for having some environmental destruction, you can have, you can be creative, be a model for the world. Australia. Looks kind of like Australia, but actually Cape Town, South you're Africa. You're in, you're in Yeah, so this, I don't know, is said to be one of the most sustainable, currently sustainable cities in Africa. So, another area of leadership. Well, I mean, there's different measures, right? You can measure things differently. This came up right there. I want to talk a little bit about indigenous cities, because in all of these sections, we've been talking about indigenous peoples and their adaptability to various landscapes. And in this, the indigenous cities, they kind of disappear, right? You don't hear about that. And in part, it's because there's a couple of reasons for this. I mean, actually, this almost seems like an oxymoron, right? To us, it's like, wait, no, indigenous people are supposed to be out in the, in the wilderness and nature or in the desert or something. Why would they be, why would people be indigenous in a city? And so there's a couple of things going on here. One of them is that colonialism, Autumn's project, made us forget that uh, the indigenous people had already formed cities that were often destroyed in colonialism. So it made us forget that people lived in cities in different places long before uh, European contact. Um, and then under colonialism, especially in the Americas, uh, people were often forced into living in uh, condensed cities or condensed places, or people would migrate there basically to lose their identity or lose their indigenous identity. So there's a couple of double things that uh, 
make us forget how uh, cities are not just a European or a North American phenomenon. One of the earliest cities in America, in the United States, is in Poverty Point, an archaeological site that Liz knows about from a different class. Liz, what do you know about this place? Wait, hold on a second. Has anybody been to Poverty Point? Does anybody know where Poverty Point is? Liz, where is it? Louisiana. Poverty Point, Louisiana. Nobody's been there or heard about it, even though it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. All right, Liz, what happened here? Well, I mean, what's also shocking is this, we have this immense area of earthen mounds and constructions. Somebody on YouTube said that, I don't know if it was mound A or mound B would require 17,000 bulldozers full of dirt if it were to be rebuilt today. So, I mean, we have a hunting and gathering population that built a urban, a, a sprawling urban center, like, 3,000 years ago, at least, and you've never heard of it in Louisiana. At the end of this YouTube video, the person said, show Poverty Point some love. Go down there and visit it. You road trippers, you should go there. Anyway, we don't even know about one of the earliest cities. It's a very puzzling place because people seem to have come here and done all kinds of things and made all these things. They didn't necessarily live there, though. So it was a huge, sprawling, amazing architecture, but not lived in. Here's another famous city in the Americas, Tenochtitlan. How could you forget? You shouldn't forget because where? Well, you should because the Spanish, they did a very good job of destroying this city. The Aztec capital. Correct, yeah. Which looked pretty good, Mexico City, you had to say. Yeah, they. but the, this city had like 200,000 people and all these causeways. and It was very cool back then. So, yes, this is what Tenochtitlan, one of the largest cities in the world. Cusco. Mickey's Project. Look at those stones, Mickey, all fit together. And I mean, are incorporated into the colonial and then the modern city of Cusco. The Inca architecture is still mixed in there. Look at that llama, yeah. Who was doing highland agriculture? Zeke? <laughs> there you go. There you go. So three... Three examples of cities in the Americas that were obviously uh, large and, and by uh, indigenous people. I was also interested in what are the largest indigenous cities today in the sense of what's the largest urban population of indigenous people. I didn't know a lot of these things. I'll see if you do. Largest percentage Native American city in the United States. Modern city. Modern city, this is today. Louis? No. No. Watertown, South Dakota. No. No. Huh? No. Uh, <laughs> no. 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 Tulsa. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 14%. It's not, um, you know. Enough there. Enough there. Oklahoma is okay. There's actually, I mean, if you're following your Supreme Court cases, this is huge battles now over jurisdictions and 
what kinds of laws are going to be in place where it's it's kind of the forefront turning point of some of the legal battles going on around indigenous jurisdiction and laws. Yeah. No, it means that fourteen percent of Tulsa's population identifies as Native Native American. And there are not just any magic words for that number. Ah, uh, that, that, There's some. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty high. It's pretty high. All right, all right. Well, if we didn't know the United States, we're definitely not going to get any of the Canadian ones, are we? No, I'll just tell you. That. Winnipeg at 11%. Now the Canadians, they are, uh, they're better than us too. Um, so if you look at, you know, when you search for these things in the United States, you have to specify and search Native American, but in Canada, you can use the word indigenous population because they also use words like the first nations, which is to say people they are not so hung up on this American thing. Or they consider themselves to be the First Nations, but they also have an identity called Metis, which is, um, if I understand correctly, is a mixed identity. So it's a, it's its own thing, but it's related to indigenous identities as well. And these guys, Isaac Richard and Drayden Bunn, are doing Winnipeg street patrols, including Save Peace Walkers. Cool, huh? You know where Winnipeg is? I didn't either. It's right up there above Minnesota, right next to that little notch that we were talking about before. See, you just hop over there and you're in Winnipeg. All right, maybe you can guess this one now. Highest percentage of indigenous population of a city in the world, in the world. No, it has to be a city in the world. It's not gonna be in the United States. No, Australia. No. You're not going to get it. It's in Greenland. It's the capital of Greenland, which is 80 to 90% Inuit. Liam, that's good for your project. Good for your project. What if you have a capital in which many people are experiencing Arctic hysteria? Which kind of laws are going to be passed? Hmm. Getting a war, oh yes, it was considered one of the world's greatest places in 2021 by Time Magazine. Seems pretty cool. I mean, cold too, but also neat. Very sustainable, very interested in sustainability. The other interesting thing is it's on a little island, so all the roads stop. So you can only get there by plane or boat. 